I said that in the episode that went up today. Even though we're more independent and we don't just go with the narrative, at the end of the day, I can't deny the fact I do lean left. And that's why I said in the recent episode when Don and I were talking about the, the candidates we're looking at, even though we lean left, we still would give decent coverage or at least acknowledge a conservative candidate. We bring up the one guy who's hardcore MAGA that's running for California. We spotlight him. We may not agree with this guy. But if you want to vote, and this is something you should care about, I may not agree with that vote, but you have the right to make that vote. Yeah. So don't act like there's no chance for you. My whole policy when it comes to voting is that if you're not going to be an informed voter, don't go to the polls. I mean, legally, ethically, sure, you have just as much say as anybody who could be much more informed than you. However, in my personal belief, I don't think anybody that has not researched every single candidate that they're voting for and understands at least their positions in detail on all of the major subjects and or their voting history or their personal history or just something about them other than what they look like and what their name is and what political party they're in. If those three things are the only things you really know about them, my opinion, your vote should not matter because your vote is worthless. And it's insane that votes from people with that limited level of knowledge are canceling out the votes of people that spend days to weeks researching every single aspect of things, trying to think critically about it trying to actually reach out to their political leaders to try to make change. People that put in a whole lot of effort get one vote. And people that put in zero effort get one vote. And they are equal votes. When it comes to anything other than president, when it comes to the votes for president, then you have the electoral college and it throws the whole thing into disarray. I mean, when you're voting for, like, what were you guys talking about? Proposition? One. Yeah. I mean, if people haven't really read through that entire proposition themselves and then read articles on what experts think is going to translate to how that plays out in the community, because if you're voting yes for low-income housing, you could very well be inviting more homeless people to the area. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you could also be supporting a system where there are the ultra wealthy that can buy multi-million dollar homes and everybody else gets low income housing, which just furthers the middle class divide. However, there is still very much a need for people to have housing that mm -hmm. don't have housing right now. Mm -hmm. And you can't really do much to completely change the whole system aside from providing them more housing now. And there is plenty of housing around the city that they could move into. They just would need to refurbish it to work as housing instead of as office space or instead of as whatever it is. I mean, providing housing is apparently a good thing for people that don't have housing. However, there are negative repercussions of that. So you really have to think about those things critically and understand all the different sides of what could happen and not just what they're trying to do like create low-income housing, but how they're trying to do it. Are these low-income housing areas going to be isolated to poor communities? That's a terrible system because then you have the poor being targeted by the nearly homeless by theft and, and any other level of crime. Mm -hmm. If you put those low-income housing areas anywhere near the wealthy, then the wealthy will find a way to make those low-income housing areas much nicer than they would otherwise be and better protected. They will either destroy them in every way they can, or they will bring them into the fold. They're not just going to let them sit there. And I think if they brought them into the fold, that would be best for everyone. So you put as much low-income housing next to expensive neighborhoods and you will see change and you will see legitimate change as mm -hmm. opposed to isolating it to those poor areas. And also how much taxpayer money is going into this and where is that money coming from? And how does that translate to the way money has been spent in the past? Like you have to look at all these things before you make a decision on whether or not you're for or against it. That's why we highlighted it. It's like yeah. they've already been raising taxes. LA did get a 20 billion surplus at one point. Where did that money go? 
And now they're saying, oh, we got to take out a $6 billion bond that's going to get paid off in 30 years on top of the 80 billion bonds that we're already having to pay back. So you're looking at it thinking like, this is such, and I brought back that term, which I said, we're going to keep using mismanagement. The way things just aren't allocated, we're not checking where things go, which for me, that's always the big thing is like, okay, like we elect people, we say yes to these things, but no one follows through. Everyone just says, oh, they got it. And we just expect they're going to do the right thing. I haven't brought it up yet, but what Nevada did to handle their homeless situation, which I know a lot of people feel a certain way about it, is they just picked an area. They said, this area, away from tourism, away from wealthy people, away from homeowners, we're going to pick this district and we're just going to mm-hmm. dump them all there. <laughs> we're going to section off this entire area. We're just going to round up all the homeless, move them there. We find someone else is homeless. They're going to get sent that way. And like I, like I told my folks, that's a solution. You know, there's all these arguments you can make about whether that's okay, whether that's humanitarian or however you want to phrase it and argue against what they did. That was a solution that they came up with that didn't impact the economy, that didn't hurt other communities. They just said, we're just going to move them over here. And this is going to be a concentrated area. But at the same time, you just create like a landfill, we're just dumping people at. Yeah. And that's not going to help them get any better at all. Yeah. And that's also going to create effectively a third world country inside of our country. Inside of every major city, there's going to be an entire district of people that don't have clean water, that don't have sewage systems, that don't have electricity or internet access or food access. There's already food deserts all around major cities in this country. Mm -hmm. And if you don't make an intentional change that requires actually taking care of the people in need and then also providing them an avenue to help themselves whenever possible it's not always possible but when it's possible that avenue should be explored but that's not what happens it's never what happens and it's insane that it just keeps going that way Yeah, we don't come up with real permanent long-term solutions and people come up with their own ideas of that. But when I hear troubling is when I hear far-right extremist points of view of like, well, let's just put the whole framework of democracy in question. You know, there's always arguments that the left is going socialist, communist, but also the right has its own authoritarian extreme views of how to take things. There's a reason why the left has been, well... And I don't even want to say the left and right, because Democrats are not left wing. Republicans are not right wing. Democrats are Democrats and Republicans are Republicans. They don't stand for anything but themselves. And within their social circle is socially acceptable. That's what they stand for, which neither of them stand for fiscal conservatism, which is what Republicans used to stand for. And neither of them stand for actually helping out the working the middle class, which is what Democrats used to stand for. So basically, both parties are just garbage, and they're basically doing the same thing. They're just doing it with a different facade on the front. Democrats are like, hey, we got your back if you're a minority. And Republicans are like, hey, we got your back if you're white and Christian. I mean, that's pretty much it. They're trying to create that kind of divide. And it's not explicit but it's very, very close to being explicit. And there's not much much else to it. That's the insane thing to me. There's so little real political stance that either side takes. They'll talk about stuff all day, but they'll never say, this is the direction we're going on this type of thing. And they also will never actually pick a hard and fast line on any in particular issue. They'll say, oh yeah, we're going to work on infrastructure. What does that mean? The last time we had a major infrastructure system set up in place in this country, we had our interstate roadways. All the highways across the country were part of a post-depression era program to get people working again. That's the whole reason that we have an interstate system. Otherwise, we would have dirt roads connecting LA and Las Vegas. We would have dirt roads across most of Texas. But now we have straight wide roads, there's regulations for those roads that span the country, 
where they have to have at least one mile of straight highway out of every five miles, which is specifically set up because we have airlines that go overhead. So any airplane will be able to find a place to land as long as they give enough warning because we can shut down any major highway at a certain exit and say, okay, you can land here. We have those systems in place to protect the country from disaster, but there have not been any systems put in place to protect us from disaster. And minimum wage was set to what it is right around that time. That's when everything basically got cut off from the New Deal. The New Deal era brought about a whole bunch of really good change for the country. A lot of people had work that never had worked before. It ushered in the era of financial growth and expansion. There was a consistent growth between workers' wages and productivity. And then Reagan happened, and then there was a divide. And bailouts happened even before Reagan, and there was a divide. And bailouts have happened with every single one of our presidents since George W. Bush after 9-11 when he bailed out the airlines. And so it just keeps growing and expanding.